Thank you, Peter, for that kind introduction. Good morning. Um, and thank the college for this invitation. I am truly honored. And not only am I honored, I am grateful. Uh, grateful because you've given me an opportunity to try to explain how I've spent 40 some odd years studying the illness of work incapacity. But more importantly, this entire period has been informed by members of the faculty of Ahmed, members of this college. This is not my first visit. It is one of many, many visits to Australia. You have uh, a wealth of collegiality. I count some of my closest friends in the profession, in this audience and in this membership. And I'm forever grateful that they put up with me, that they're willing to hold me accountable, and they keep inviting me back to see if I finally got it right. So I'll try again. Now let me tell you what happened to me when I decided to, to join the faculty at the University of North Carolina in the early 70s. I was an exceedingly well-trained rheumatologist and a pretty good physical biochemist and really bright. It's never been the same. It's been downhill ever since. And, and I went to my very first clinic in University of North Carolina, and my very first patient was a middle-aged man who looked at me and said, Doc, I injured my back and I don't know if I can go to work. And I had never heard such a chief complaint. In all of this fancy, elegant, advantage education, I had never heard about backache. I didn't understand what he meant by I injured my back. And it occurred to me that the illness of working capacity was part and parcel of, of all illness experiences. The fear that you not may, may no longer be able to support yourself or your family for whatever consequence you ascribed to the disease that you thought brought you to medical attention. Um, I, I told that patient that I have no idea what to tell that patient. And I spoke to my colleagues and they said I was too good a physical chemist to worry about stuff like that and it's not really academic, which is the wrong thing to say to me. So I decided I would figure out what is known about the complaint I injured my back. I mean, this was not he fell down the stairs. He was doing nothing that had not been comfortable and customary in the past. And I had not thought about, in fact, I had not been taught that our patients actually leave the clinic. We only thought that they stayed there for us so that we could be very bright and figure out why they were sick. So I went to the library and I, I looked at the literature and it was largely orthopedic drivel. It was an exercise in hubris and braggadocio and there was nothing of substance in it. And uh, it's a little better. Uh, there's, um, and I, I started to talk to folks and I started to realize that I, I'm one of these people who reads a lot of things and likes to write and I started to write about this and read about this and realized that not only is illness socially constructed, but the role of the physician faced with illness is socially, politically constrained. That had never occurred to me before. And then something very interesting happened. I caught a paper that talked about an epidemic of the illness of work incapacity ascribed to arm pain in New South Wales and Victoria. That's fascinating, I said. And I applied to the WHO, the World Health Organization, for a traveling fellowship, which they gave me. And in the mid-80s, I spent a month in Australia and New Zealand. And uh, one of the most important and memorable months in my career, thanks to people I see in this audience, thanks to people who were your colleagues, and many were your predecessors. Uh, the anecdotes are terrific. It was, I was a guest of the Australian government and the ACC in, in Wellington. I have wonderful memories of both. I remember bending an elbow with beer in the John Curtin pub that was someplace here in Melbourne with Zagoras, John Zagoras, and a whole bunch of socialists. And we were singing labor songs and going eyeball to eyeball about RSI. 
I, I remember getting the keys to the city of uh, Wollongong, and I remember, best of all, walking with my host in, in Wellington, who was a man I knew from my time, my stints in London, a man named Hugh Berry, who was the medical consultant. Uh, Hugh was a brilliant physician, a very articulate, brilliant physician. Uh, I knew that. And I knew something that he was a New Zealand all black. I didn't know what a New Zealand all black made, meant until I walked down the street. I, I forever have been trying to mimic that strut and then, because it's like a Hollywood star, it's absolutely amazing. Sometimes I do it in the States and it's a guaranteed snicker for my wife. But, but you taught me a lot about the ACC and the folks who are trying to run it and the folks who are trying to cope with the illness of working capacity. And, and then I had, I've done many visits because of the different hats I wear, visiting professorships. And I did one in Adelaide not long after. And um, when, I'm, when I'm away for a period of time, I ask for a day off, and if it's a pretty day, I go cycling, and I cycled every bank, every inch of the Torrance River for miles. But it was a rainy day, and I went to the art gallery looking for the Celadon collection, because it actually is a very interesting collection. I was walking downstairs, and there was a gallery with a big sign, Native Australian Art Exhibit. And at the far end of the gallery, there was an image that beckoned to me, and that has still beckoned to me. So I walked down the gallery. This is a, my, my need as a congenital clinician to give you a case to structure your thinking about. And next to this image was the artist's narrative. <clears throat> this is Julie Dowling, and here's what she said. She was 30 at the time. Uh, she said, <clears throat> I got sick on May 7th when I tried to lift up a six kilogram stereo system. I found out from my doctor that I had a back condition, which was hereditary, and that my sister may have the condition as well. It's called spinal stenosis. My spinal cord won't fit through my bone. My Yamataji grandmother, Molly, says that when your back hurts, it means that I don't have a kind of direction in my life. I talk to my ancestors every night to help guide me through my pain and confusion, and now I think I found myself again through my artwork. All the little problems now fade away. I love my family. While I was sick, my mother and sister took care of me for four months until I could walk again with my crutches. My mom had to do everything for me. My aunties Liz and Pat would help by getting my medicines and food. I think it must be terrible to be sick and all alone without your family or somebody to love or care for you until you get better. My family believes that when a person is sick that their spirit is taken back into the land and that only the people, particularly the family, can make you well again. It's always better with mom. I feel afraid when my doctor says that my family may all have the same back problem. I'm afraid for them all now. That's called an illness narrative. It's laced with idioms that are peculiar to the patient. These are idioms that are peculiar to her social cultural background. They um, sound strange to most of us. They sound like there's an overlay that's metaphysical to most of us. It would be hard for most of us to give a similar illness narrative. We are a much more scientifically rigorous population. Um, I, I need you to remember Julie Dowling as we go through the next 30 minutes, because we'll return to whether or not her narrative is any more metaphysical than ours. So let me go back to my library search. And here's my problem, and, and Skye's gonna help me with this. She, I told her to allow me only four digressions, and after four digressions, she gets the hook. Because my problem is that I can, on every one of these slides, I can go for weeks, and you don't want me to do that because there's a really important talk that follows this. So I'm gonna to try to behave. So I'm not gonna start where I would usually start, which was the Edwin Smith papyrus. Uh, I would go on to the Old Testament and tell you what Jacob's Ladder was really all about and why he had sciatica and what it's done to us as thinking. I could talk about Shakespeare, but I'm not gonna do that. I'm going to start toward the end of the Industrial Revolution. I'm going to start in Victorian England. And I'm going to start with this man 
who um, really is not memorable. Uh, he was sort of um, eh, editor of Punch. And, and to this day, I don't know what drove him to do what he did, but he decided to categorize the street people of London at the end of the Victorian era. Um, it was very noblesse oblige. He went about, about 20% of the population of London was living on the streets then, at least. So it wasn't hard to find folks. And, and he was doing it the way Lenek would. He was coming up with his nosology for the street people. And then he ended up with these four categories. Now, they weren't his originally, um, particularly the notion that there are those who won't work, who really don't deserve to be cared about. That notion is quite old. It, it, it actually underlies what were called the Elizabethan Poor Laws, which existed at this point, where, which were noblesse oblige laws, the nobility and gentry were to decide who deserved to be cared for when they couldn't support themselves. That actually not only started in Elizabethan England, but continued well through the Edwardian period, the poor laws. I can tell you about the ones we had in our colonies. I can tell you about the ones we had in your colony. I can also tell you that there was one moment when the tradition of finding the person who wants help but doesn't deserve it was discarded. It was called the Spinan Lamp experiment. It was the end of the 1700s and is intimately involved with the history of this country, of Australia. And it actually colors some of your legislation ever since. It was not a test of worthiness who deserved help. It was a test of means. It was a negative income tax experiment. But Sky already told me that I've used two of my digressions, so I can't go there. And, and I almost I always think it's more important than where I'm going, but I'm not going to go there. Uh, the, the poor laws um, were vicious, and the reason we know they're vicious is there was another person who went out in the streets of London at this time to um, feel it, actually. He, he dressed up as a street person and spent a winter on the streets, and at night he would go to the asylum, the poor laws established sort of rooming houses. People in the streets in London at this time had no problem with fecundity or longevity. So this man, and, and unless you knew this already, will surprise you, it was Jack London. The young, this is Jack London of Call of the Wild, this is Jack London of Dawson, this is Jack London of Panning for Gold, this is, he was a violent socialist as a young man. He, he um, outgrew it, sadly, but this is when he was violent, violence, and he wrote this book. And, what am I doing? I'm not doing well, because I'm not, not even near the end of my introduction. Sky, it's your fault. I'll just read one paragraph so that we all understand where we came from and how we got where we are today. The unfit and the unneeded, the miserable and despised and forgotten, dying in the social shambles. This is after spending a night in an asylum. The progeny of prostitution, of the prostitution of men and women and children, of flesh and blood and sparkle and spirit and brief, the prostitution of labor. This is the best that civilization could do for the human than give us howling and naked savagery. Far better to be a people of the wilderness and desert, of the cave and the squatting place, than to be a people of the machine and of the abyss. Interesting times. Interesting times. And um, not only um, painful for the people of the abyss, but painful for the people who were witnessing it. And it was a time of great social tur turmoil, and Sky won't let me go there, but I'd love to draw the parallels between the first decade of the 20th century and the first decade of the 21st. Because there was anger. There was more than a little anger, there was violence. There was a new phenomenon, there was the Plaintiff's Bar came into being. The Union Movement came into being. A few authors came into being. There was Marx and Engels and LaSalle. It was a very, very busy time. And, and it was not unknown. So Lloyd George, and we could go there, Skywalk. Lloyd George 
is um, watching and he's sending the Chancellor of the Exchequer over to Berlin because interesting things were happening in the, Reich, in the Reichstag. Uh, the, um, the Kaiser's crown was a little unsteady. And Bismarck, who I can assure you did not have a drop of human kindness anywhere in his vascular system, was trying to figure out how to calm the people. So he, over the course of about 10 years, fashioned what is called, he called it, a welfare monarchy. He said to these unionists and labor activists and socialists, we don't need you. I'm going to give you everything you need. I'm gonna, now, remember this slide, and remember this is Bismarck's slide. This was not a stone tablet that came down to Mount Sinai. Because when I take you through this, you'll know it well. You'll, this, is, this is called linguistic determinism. This is what we live with to, in our fashion to this day. This slide metastasized to every so-called advanced industrializing country. Everyone has played with it a bit, tweaked it a bit. New Zealand was early on in tweaking. We, the, the, the countries that have tweaked it the least is mine. And what the Japanese have done with it is fascinating. Uh, not only have I studied this in Australia and New Zealand, but I've studied it in 12 countries. It's a moving target and the tweaking is a reflection of the social construction of charity. How much are we willing to do and how often are we willing to ignore that there might be somebody out there who should work, could work, but won't. So he said, I'm gonna base recourse and comfort and security on levels of worthiness. And the most worthy person in our society is the person with the illness of working capacity who was injured in the workplace. Now when Mayu went out there, in his people who can't work category were a lot of injured workers. And they had no recourse because of civil law at the time, which said, nobody made you take that job. You can't, there's nobody to blame. The, the colliery fell down on you, you lost your foot, both hands, and uh, blind in one eye. Even the fact that you're a God-fearing father of six who, who doesn't drink, doesn't matter. Tough luck, Charlie. Well, that was hard, so they said, okay, if you can prove that you didn't contribute, there was no contributory negligence, maybe we'll mollify it, but not much because, after all, the only recourse you have is with your supervisor who told you to go down the mine shaft. The owner of the mine was in his estate in the south of France. What did he have to do with that? That's called the fellow servant rule. So essentially, there was no recourse for this guy. And unless he had access to family or a religious order, he had nothing better than the streets and the poor laws. So this is the most worthy person, and all of everybody gets subsidized health care, but this guy gets his wages guaranteed. He is going to be put better, and while he's made as better, he'll get his full wages. And when he cannot be made better yet, if he can't go back to his prior employment, we will, we, the Prussian monarchy, will subsidize whatever income he can make so his earnings are not compromised. That's workers' compensation. It's called workmen's compensation. Now, if you worked, and you no longer can because of a disease, rheumatoid arthritis, something like that, that's really tragic, but not so tragic. If you can't work at all, if you can't work at all, we'll give you enough money so you won't be on the streets. But we won't compensate your wages. And if you've never worked, and now tell me you can't, we'll give you a pittance. Wouldn't keep you off the streets, barely. Probably not at all, but a pittance. So this was the worthiness-based notion of recourse for the illness of working capacity. And Bismarck knew from the get-go that he needed help with the administration, and so he turned 
to the Prussian doctor for the critical administrative conundrums. The Prussian doctor at the time was strutting the world. They were the epitome of reductionistic medicine. They thought they knew it all. If you wanted to become anybody or anything in academic medicine, you had to spend at least a year in Prussia. Don't get me started on that. The, um, Bismarck's government said, I need, I need to make this work to be sure I understand what an injury was. Were you injured? And that's the proximal cause of your illness or work capacity. The Prussian doctor said, are you kidding? We know what an injury is. No problem. He said, okay, I I'm going to pay these folks who are injured their full wages until they're as good as they get. Huh. Can you tell me when there is, that's depending on where you live, called consolidation or maximum medical improvement or fixed and stable or a whole bunch of buzzwords for that. And once they're consolidated or maximally medically improved, I need another thing from you docs. Is there a way to figure out how much work is left in the man? Hmm. So the Prussian doctor said, well, that's easy too. I mean, just think about it. They said, we're scientific doctors. Scientific Western medicine was discovered and founded by Thomas Sydenham on a rainy Sunday afternoon in London in 1701. It's actually amazing. Before that rainy Sunday afternoon, all of Western medicine was symptom-based. So you went to your doctor with your symptom, hey, I'm coughing up a lot of phlegm. And the doctor diagnosed you based on your symptom, hey, you've got catarrh, which means you're coughing up a lot of phlegm. And, and Sydenham said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. They're coming with their symptoms, which I call the illness. Our job is to figure out the underlying cause, which I call a disease. There are lots of ways to fiddle with this language. There has to be an underlying disease. Someday we'll figure out how to treat the underlying disease so that as a consequence, the symptoms go away. That's scientific Western medicine. It's wonderful, it works. One patient out of 20, but it really works. And, and it's easy, but it really makes us smile. It's kind of neat. Well, the Prussian doctor said this really works all the time because we're never fooled by this disease illness paradigm. And if I have to find the disease because of the illness, I can go the other way around. You name the disease, I, the Prussian doctor, can predict the illness. If you have enough disease, you'll have more illness. And if you have so much disease, you'll have the illness of working capacity. In, in parlance, the measurement of disease is in, called impairment. This is impairment-based disability determination. Uh, it is part and parcel of our culture. In every, I was telling the, the fellows when I was lecturing a couple of days ago, I, I'm in trouble calling ever since Trump was elected, I, I don't know what an advanced country is. I, I it just, it, it's gone away for me. So I now talk about countries where it's safe to drink the water. In all countries where it's safe to drink the water, this notion, this screen slide, this mindset is totally fixed, entrenched with this common sense. Right? So, the common sense actually determines our language. It's really interesting. They, they're, um, it determines how we think about each other. It's very pervasive. It, it's not a bad thing, or, or it is a bad thing, but it is a human thing. So those notions, injury, consolidation, and impairment-based disability determination permeate our lives. They're all over the place, and they've always been a problem. For example, from the beginning, they had a get-go with the notion of injury. The first battle was on telegraphist's wrist. The Brits said, that's not an injury. This was a fascinating battle on railway spine. You know about railway spine? If I say railway spine to, to most people, they think it's the people who lay the track, who fell off the clip, who were, because there were a tremendous number of injuries in the early days of the railroad. No. Railway spine happened to the passengers. It was thought by Queen uh, Victoria's surgeon, John Erickson, 
that the shaking and rolling of the carriage would cause a contusion of the spine that you would feel so incredibly fragile and weak and have lots of trouble feeling fatigued and you'd never get better. By the way, I wrote a paper once uh, uh, about this time actually and, uh, on the four laws of therapeutic dynamics. The second law is there's never been a quack without a theory. The first law, by the way, is the death rate is one per person, but she's not going to let me do any more. The, um, the, the Brits love this, and so did Queen Victoria. Her carriage in the early railroads was made to crawl through the countryside because everybody was afraid of railway spine. The, the Americans had a, a lucid moment, which we don't have very often, uh, we usually cover it up with money and power, but the Boston neurology world said, ah, that's psychosomatics. And, and 1932, do you know that you couldn't injure your back before 1932? It wouldn't be sensible, there, there was no semiotic for it. It would be like having a headache and walking into my office saying, doc, I injured my head. It, it, it couldn't happen until one paper in the New England Journal of Medicine. Now, there was a famous senior neurosurgeon named William Mixter, and one of his fames was the study of benign tumors of the spine. There was a young orthopedist named Joe Barr who read German. And Joe said, I read these papers out of Heidelberg, and it says that those things are not tumors. They're not chordomas and notochord arrests. Those are extrusions of the nucleus of pulposus through the annulus. And Mixter said, this was in the so-called brick corridor of the Massachusetts General Hospital. Mixter said, really? And Barr said, yeah, really? So they went to the pathology and anatomy lab, and they cut into a whole bunch of cadavers, and it turned out that Heidelberg was right, a man named Heine. And then they were surgeons and they said, well, gee whiz, maybe we ought to figure out a way to put it back. So this paper describes 19 patients, most of whom had caught equina. Uh, Joe Barr was a young orthopod and I guess Mixter was feeling bad for him because he was standing around sucking lollipops while Mixter was doing the neurosurgical thing. And he said to Joe, hey Joe, maybe, maybe if you ought to fuse it which is why fusion is an American invention, and, and still is. And um, they published this paper. And when they published this paper, they did two things that are inexcusable, but almost everybody would do it except for me. And they thought they were doing something important. And not only that, they thought that what they were doing that was important generalized to all backache. What's inter interesting is they knew what they were doing, but I'll get there in one second. So when they wrote the paper, instead of the title of extrusion of the nucleus of propulsus through the annulus fibrosis as a cause of cauda equina, they said ruptured disc. It was 1932, it was the early days of workers' compensation legislation. Nobody knew that a backache was an injury, but every one of the judges in the ALJ system had a dictionary and you looked up rupture and it's a tearing apart, tearing asunder. If the outcome is so violent, it doesn't matter what caused it, it's an injury. And furthermore, the certifying event was a scar of any length that was or was not well healed any place near the lumbosacral spine, which created the epidemic of back surgery, which has yet to go away. Uh, and uh, the notion of an injury of a bad back, of a surgical remedy. The fact that about 80% now of the cost of everybody's workers' compensation plans relate to nonviolent illness capacity at the lumbosacral spine or still arm pain in some, some countries, some jurisdictions. Uh, that's only 20% of the claims, but it's 80% of the cost. The, the other 80% of the claims are things that we would call injury without wondering. Get your finger cut off, get your arm cut off, get burnt, get lacerations. Th those folks, which by the way shouldn't ever happen, they are treated incredibly efficiently, uh, incredibly well 
by the surgical community and almost always go back to full work as heroes. This slide captures a different station in life. Uh, by the way, Joe Barr, before he died, published a paper with John C. Namaya, a psychiatrist, and they, they knew, Mixter and Barr, what they were doing when they used the word rupture. Sort of interesting, I wish they had not. It, it would have spared a tremendous number of people, unnecessary surgery, disabling issues, opiate addiction, a whole bunch of stuff that actually circulates around this slide. And impairment-based disability determination. Jesus, this is almost the end of my introduction. It's your fault. I asked her, I said, no digressions. Uh, another observer, uh, a man that, uh, by the way, there's nothing wrong with us in medicine reading beyond uh, the New England Journal of Medicine. It, not only that, it informs a lot of our thinking. And, and I can tell you that back in the days when I was a pretty good physical chemist, that was easy. You, you never did anything unless you could understood all the variables and control. You knew it was going to be a fully, I'm, I'm just starting, <laughs> a fully reproducible experiment. Uh, everything we talk about has limitations and certainty. Sometimes they're overwhelming. And that's why you need a doctor. You didn't have to go to medical school to do colonoscopy, trust me. You had to go to medical school to decide that you didn't need it. The um, Kafka was uh, a sort of sad character in Prague. He had graduated from law school. There's a whole literature that I actually contribute to on, on what was going on in Kafka's mind when he wrote the trial. Uh, he, uh, when he died young of tuberculosis, his will gave all of his papers and manuscripts to the poet Max Brode, his friend, and he, the will stipulated that they were to be destroyed. And fortunately, Rhodes said no to his fiduciary responsibilities. The trial, if you haven't read it, is the story of a man, a rather bland bank clerk, who is arrested and brought before a tribunal and tried and goes through an enormous agony of being accused and finally being convicted and finally committing suicide. The trouble is nobody ever told him what his crime was. And it is very clear that that couldn't have been written by Kafka if he wasn't working in the first iteration of workers' compensation in Prague at the time he was writing. Yeah, the, let me, um, since they tell me now that I'm running out of time, today we, we accept, the, we, we do, not just administratively, not just legislatively, but in our thinking, we accept the notion of a regional back injury that in the course of activities that are customary and customarily comfortable, you have a backache and you should assume that without any trauma or violence that you have injured your back. And you should assume that the motion that makes it hurt worse is the motion that made it hurt in the first place. And that is a driving force not only for workers' comp but for society. There are more potions, more people willing to gird your loins and step on your back and, and there are these enormous aisles for the placebos and whole food. It, it is an enormous business. It is part of our culture. It's, it's still, I am, I'm by the way halfway through my talk and they tell me I'm done, but I've got 10 minutes. It, it is still fascinating. You know, um, how we got this ide fix, would, would you call the common cold a nose injury? It, it is an occupational disease because that's where you got your droplet infection. Do you call angina a stair climber's chest? Do, do you, oh, I, can, I could make the same argument. How do you have tennis elbow if you don't play tennis? And, and why, when your secretary calls in and he says to you, I can't come in today, I have the flu. It doesn't bother you even though you know he may not have the flu. His spouse may have the flu. He may have something he's got to do with his brother-in-law. And, 
And if he doesn't come back tomorrow, you call up and say, how you doing, Joe? But if he calls up and says, I, have a, I injured my back, you won't call him back. You'll get HR involved. Let me um, use a few minutes to, um, to take the, the first slide I was going to do with a, um, a, a tremendous amount of science. Because in the past 40 years, this went from assumed to be understood to one of the richest, mo most robust scientific literatures in any clinical discipline. It is just amazing how much we know about what I've just been talking about. It is equally amazing how much it doesn't matter to the population at large or to the legislation. There are very few fields. Let me, let me put this slide in your head. This is what we know about backache. If any one of you goes one year without a backache, that's abnormal. And the moments you get your next backache, you must do something about it. And, and what you must do about it is yours to choose. You have probably three options. Physicians usually only have two. You have three options. Uh, you can choose to deal with it. Stay a person with a backache. You can choose to come tell me, in which case you're no longer a person, you're a patient. Or you can choose to, somebody in, to tell somebody in the context of work, in which case you're no longer a person, you're a claimant. And the claim depends on the language of your complaint. If it's the language of injury, you're a claimant for workers' comp, otherwise you're a claimant for illness insurance. And the consequences are dramatically different with each choice. And the literatures are dramatically different. They have nothing in common, their silos. And we have no word for processing that choice except pejorative terms. If you tell me there's no way you'd come to me, I'd call you a denier. And if you tell me you'll come any time your back twinges, I'll call you a hypochondriac. But I have no word for just right. And it's got to be your just right. And the consequences are enormous. I've got, what, one minute? This is Michael Marmot's work. This is the Whitehall study. Uh, if you don't know it, you should. And uh, you should know some of the corollary studies. Whitehall is a cohort study of the bureaucracy in Britain for about 35 years in waves of cohorts. And the original intent of the study was whether or not people who uh, died sooner uh, had a high cholesterol and a gut-butt ratio and all the usual cardiovascular litany. And what, they, what he first observed is the higher your, your civil service rank, the longer you lived. And then he looked for the correlations with your cholesterol and so forth, and he found them, but they were tiny. And then he asked, do you like your job? And that subsumed all of the association. And he's tried to parse it, and so have others. And the, as soon as you try to parse it, the associations become very tiny. I can capture about 80% of your mortal hazard, 80% of the fact that you will die before your time. 80% of the fact that you will lose four to seven years of longevity with one question, are you comfortable in your skin? And I can break that one question down into components, but only two. One of the components is, do you like your job? If you say no, that's four to five years of all-cause mortality. Other things go on. But all cause it's also the cause of obesity. And we're loaded with data that weren't discussed yesterday. There's a big debate about whether or not being overweight is good for you. It's certainly not bad. And whether obese is bad, it's certainly not more than a trivial amount bad. The WHO curve has been redone. One of the most important data sets was a 10-year, 10,000-person cohort from this country. But if you factor in socioeconomic status, job satisfaction, and whether or not you're comfortable in your socioeconomic ecological niche, you'll come up with the correlations. 
And one of the symptoms of I'm very uncomfortable in my niche is metabolic syndrome itself is nothing more than a surrogate measure. Well, I really do apologize because I did manage. Oh, I got five minutes? Thank you. I'm not going to be able to finish, but I am going to be able to, to move on. This actually is true. Nobody ever goes to a doctor with a complaint of backache. Nobody ever goes. The complaint always is, Doc, my back is killing me and I can't cope with this episode. If we don't learn how to elicit that history, we'll never help our patients. The reason you can't cope with it may be metastatic breast cancer, prostate, but it may be that you work for a fascist, or it may be that your kid's shooting heroin, or it may be that your marriage is falling. And in our culture, that next backache becomes more painful. It would for you too, it does for you too. The choice to be a claimant is one of the most complicated stations in life the Western world has ever created. That's why it engaged Kafka. The moment you do that, you're in a contest. Were you really injured? You're in a brutal contest um, as a claimant, even though we know that when we take a look at why people's coping with back pain in the workplace is confounded, and we ask whether can we ascribe it to the physical demands of tasks, or can we ascribe it to some contextual aspect of life in the workforce. The physical demands of tasks are inconsistently and barely measurable as a cause of coming to be a back pain claimant. It's all contextual. And, and once you battle that, you end up in the contest of fixed and stable because these are claimants. They're not patients. These people can't tell you to go stuff it because the implication is, I no, I don't want you to do this crazy procedure on my back. What kind of nonsense is that? If you say that, you really don't want to get well, do you? And fixed and stable means we ran out of horrible things to do to you, all of which are subsidized and paid for. And you leave this slide and enter this slide, which I call the vortex of disability determination, where people sit in judgment of you and say things like, that pain's not so bad, get on with it. Go into work hard and go into rehab. These folks are changed forever by this experience, it plays out over a year, some of the most evil things that we do to them, and it's not because people are evil, and it's not because I'm pointing figures, it's because we have a socially iatrogenic paradigm for the treatment of the illness of working capacity. That IME has asked for a statement of disability determination. Let me just quickly show you one of the very rare studies that have looked at disability determination. The reason we can't get this data is they won't let us. There are now a couple of studies like this. Uh, what we did is we found one workers' comp dist district that uh, allowed us to look at the records of case closure for claimants with back injuries, about 4,000 of them. Two years later, we asked them, how are you doing? We only found 2,000 of them. It's hard to find Americans. They disappear. At the, if you look at the disability ratings at the close of claim and compare that with the answer to the question, what you doing now? The correlation between the disability rating and the function in life is zero. This is a total and complete sophism that occupies a tremendous amount of energy effort in making people sicker. And, and I'll leave you with one last notion and half of my talk unspoken. The notion is that nobody gets better if they have to prove they're sick. And everybody could use a physician who says, I don't sit in judgment. I wanna know your illness narrative. I, I wanna know how I can help you. I'm not here, if you, want, if you want to get judged, go to people who do that for a living. I don't do that for a living. And, and if you remember Julie Dowling, 
hard talk except for the sprinkling of surgical nonsense was not any more metaphysical than the way we've been taught to think about backache. And, and if I could, I was going to show you the NDIS because I was invited to give a big talk in 2013 when we were rolling it out. And, and I love what it's about and I love the notion just like I love the intent of a lot of what we're talking about here. But it's very hard, almost impossible, to write a new law without discarding all the old language. And they're loaded with it. And what they haven't realized, and I bet you now, three years later, they've realized it. Let me just take you back to Julie. Is that these are notions that work sometimes for people who are disabled as the driving reason that they have the illness of working capacity. But a tremendous number of people are disabled and have the illness of working capacity because they're disallowed, disaffected, and disavowed. And the same approach, the same notion that we think ought to work doesn't work. In fact, they get sicker. And, and until we accept that, until we accept that, whoops, and use a totally different ethic to, to talk about this and to talk about our role in it. We're going to have meetings all over the world about it's out of control, the IMEs are paid too much, these too many people are, are really bad people. No, this is a bad idea and it's long overdue to redo it. Thank you.